You guys want to watch my show? Uh, do we have a choice? Countess Katie here, your movie mistress, your cinema siren, your film fatale. <coughs> hey, it's Halloween! Or sometime near Halloween. If I can't be dramatic now, when can I? Anyway, we've got something different for you this All Hallows October Eve. A compilation of the best and worst made-for-TV movies created solely to cash in on those sweet, sweet holiday feels. That doesn't mean they're all bad, but it certainly doesn't mean they're all good, either. For this list, I have three very important bits of criteria. One, it has to be made for TV, no theatrical release. Two, it has to be independent of another series, so as good as a lot of them are, no Halloween episodes. And three, it should be relatively obscure. So no, Hocus Pocus will not be on this list. A lot of these movies have been made more well known through the valiant efforts of YouTubers such as Familiar Faces. Since I'm going to be covering a lot of movies, I'm going to try to keep it simple, and each movie will get a score at the end. Moving from fifth worst and fifth best to first worst and first best. But enough splitting hairs. Let's move into the meat and bone of this list with our fifth worst. Lumpkin the Pumpkin, 1994. Deep inside the pumpkin patch, sitting in a row, the strangest pumpkins you have ever seen. Oh boy, here we go. Lumpkin the Pumpkin is a cutesy cartoon pseudo-musical, which normally wouldn't be so bad, but I think they had a grand total of three voice actors working on this thing. Four if I'm being generous. And I think just as many animators were involved. Tara's mother, Maggie, who is voiced by the same man who plays Lumpkin, wants to be head witch. And apparently in order to do that, you have to pick the biggest, scariest pumpkin in the patch. So she sings us a song about it. Witches have to be scary. They need a pumpkin to carry. Enormous in size, with fire in his eyes, to scare the kids on Halloween. Cheese and rice. Couldn't the actress playing Tara have played her mother if she was gonna sing? Or is that just a bridge too far for this already limited cast? Anyway, Maggie lets Tara pick the pumpkin, and of course, she picks the cutest, smallest, derpiest pumpkin in the entire patch, proving she learned nothing from the song. Despite this, they go to the witches' gathering anyway, where everyone makes fun of Maggie for the pumpkin Tara picked. It's true, having children really does crush your dreams. The head witch tells them to get out there and scare some people with their pumpkins. The first witch fails. The second witch also fails. I'm with this kid, what the hell? And then there's Tara, who doesn't even want to try. She spends her time walking around, talking kids out of doing bad things, and even helps a little girl scare some bullies, and then tells her that scaring is wrong! 
but mostly it's about making kids safe on Halloween. Lumpkin even sings a stupid song about it! I could make it safe at night for every boy and girl If just one Lumpkin wish came true for me Then Tara almost gets herself hit by a car, which inspires her to ruin everyone else's costumes by plastering Lumpkin's big derpy face all over them. This is really a glorified safety video for trick-or-treaters, which explains why Tara went to a stranger's house with no repercussions. <laughs> And she was never seen or heard from again. The end. Psh, I wish. Instead, the cult of Lumpkin rises up and overthrows the head witch's oppressive regime. Again, I wish. A bunch of kids show up and unknowingly scare a bunch of grown-ass women with pumpkin stickers and other Lumpkin merch. Available now wherever tacky garbage is sold. Then Tara is made the head witch and proceeds to ruin Halloween for literally everyone. It may be insufferable, but it's mercifully short, unlike the rest of the rotten pumpkins on this list. Lumpkin the Pumpkin gets a solid five enchanted pumpkin footballs out of ten. Dear Dracula, 2012. How Dracula Got His Groove Back would be a fitting alternate title for this, the most contemporary entry on our list. It's a made-for-TV CGI movie that premiered on Cartoon Network in 2012 and was played on stealth mode for a few years after. It's one of those you were cool all along stories with Ray Liotta as Dracula and Emilio Estevez as Myro, who is totally not Igor or Renfield, you guys. Original character, do not steal. The characters have that sort of big-headed, round quality indicative of made-for-TV CGI, but there are some really nice lighting effects. Sam is a total horror movie nerd. Oh, excuse me, a classic horror movie aficionado. He writes a letter to Dracula telling him how cool he is, which strikes me as something that a young Katie Lyon would do, and it makes me like him even more. Dracula responds by showing up to Sam's house and hypnotizing his grandma when she's ready to throw down when she thinks he's trying to sell her a coffin. Sam shows Drac what's fresh on the horror scene, but Dracula isn't having any of it. That was rubbish! Absolute hogwash! Vampires aren't pretty boys that sparkle in the sun. Real vampires burn and crumble into dust when exposed to daylight. <laughs> Again, very relatable. Meanwhile, Sam is scared of going to a party that his neighbor Emma invited him to because he's afraid he'll get picked on for being weird. So Dracula makes a deal with him. You help me get my scared in this bag, and I'll help you show people what Sam is all about. Which he does. Sam finds out that he and Emma have a lot in common, and Drax scares the piss out of everyone there. But to show he's a good sport, he dials it back for the kids. Scream! <laughs> oh, they were so scared! Why did you have to ruin it? Even though this movie is kind of predictable, you can tell that a lot of effort went into making it, despite it being made for TV. The lighting effects and character movement are nicely rendered, and the mouth movement is only a little off. I think this movie will resonate with a lot of people for a lot of different reasons. And it's a great reminder that meeting your heroes isn't always bad. Oh, and Weber is the most adorable spider, so that's bonus points. I give Dear Dracula... Six cute spiders out of ten. Once upon a midnight scary, 1979. Alas, poor Vincent. Not even he could carry this collection of cringe-worthy chronicles. This horror anthology premiered on CBS in 1979, making it the oldest on our list. Let's take a moment to appreciate the quality of CBS at the time. Did you steal the Zertigo diamond? Absolutely not. Did you steal the Zertigo diamond? No. Well, I'm convinced. This anthology adapts three stories. The Ghost Belonged to Me by Richard Peck, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow by Washington Irving, and The House with a Clock in Its Walls by John Belairs, which was adapted again in 2018 and starred Jack Black, if you're interested in seeing it done better. Everyone and their grandma has adapted Sleepy Hollow. But I've really gotta hand it to CBS for getting their hands on some contemporary books. 
The Ghost Belonged to Me had only been published for three years before this special came out. The Ghost Belonged to Me is the first and shortest of the three, and has the flavor of urban legend. Oh, Blossom, it's you! Doggone it! Actually, with acting like that, it tastes more like stale creepypasta. Our young protagonist is told that he has a ghostly responsibility in the barn that only he can shoulder. He goes to investigate only to discover... <laughs> That ghosts make spaceship noises? Oh, and that a drowned girl needs his help to save a busload of kids. Well, at least it was short. Then we jump back almost a hundred years to Sleepy Hollow. And that's where things get, uh, fun. You guys know how this goes. The Van Tassel's party is winding down, and the resident schoolmaster is putting the moves on the richest girl in town. But here comes Brom Bones to bust his hustle. Out, uh, wrestling with the pigs again, eh, Mr. Bones? <laughs> there ain't no sport in wrestling pigs, school teacher. But whomping a bit on swine's another thing altogether. <laughs> Tell me, uh, Mr. Bones, how many muscles do you have? Uh, counting your head, of course. Um, Miss Katrina is being escorted home by me. Like I said, she ought to have a man with her, Ichabod. Oh! Your oh, oh, my oh, oh. After that savage beating, Ichabod sets his sights on home. You know, honestly, this is something you guys just have to hear to believe. Now maybe if we just walk along, oh dear, we pretend that nothing's wrong. He's walking too, he's walking too, I don't know what this means. Oh, whoa, gun found in my foot. Yeah, my foot came out of the stirrup here. Yeah, oh my goodness, I thought. Oh, please, Mr. Nice Horseman, sir, I'm just on my way. Please don't hurt me with the hooves and the fire and the nay, 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 it scares me. Hoil! <laughs> And nothing of value was lost. Moving on to our final timid terror tale, we join a recently orphaned Lewis who's gone to live with his crazy uncle Jonathan, and they're going to do... I have things planned. Things. Well, luckily, Jonathan isn't the creepiest uncle you could have. He's just a wizard. And he's trying to find a doomsday clock in his walls. Despite having searched for many years, he still hasn't found it. But after just one night, Lewis finds the plans! But they still need to find the actual clock. While they're searching, Lewis shoots his mouth off to the local generic bully. Wizard is the term if you want to be professionally precise. Yep, we are. It runs in the family. It's a gift. You gotta be born with it. Jeez, kid, tell the neighborhood, why don't ya? Regardless, the bully doesn't believe him and wants him to prove it by, say, oh, I don't know, raising the dead? You know, first-level wizard stuff. Uncle Jonathan, I went to the graveyard and raised the dead. Most parents would ground the hell out of their little necromancer, but not Uncle Jonathan. You are part of the family. You passed the test. But Uncle Jonathan is not as thrilled when he learns who Lewis brought back. If, if somebody kills someone, that's murder, you go to prison. You kill ten people, you go to Texas, they hit you with a brick, that's what they do. Mrs. Izzard's home, and she's looking for her husband's doomsday clock. Apparently, the two of them hated each other so much that setting it off before he can come back to do it himself would satisfy her like nothing else. But before she can do that, Jonathan and Lewis come up with the most stupid plan I have ever heard. It probably can't understand magic, but it isn't logical. Maybe we can confuse it. Let's use some magic that doesn't make any sense at all! So, the answer to every logic puzzle, ever, is no logic. Well, okay, whatever. It works. And they find the clock, and Mrs. Izzard shows up with Jonathan's Hand of Glory, which paralyzes him. Cake or death? Uh, cake, please. But Lewis knows better than to look at it. I command you! Lewis destroys the clock, and I guess kills Mrs. Izzard in the process, and that's the end of that. Well done! Well done! Rough. This was a slog to get through. Just 
Go read the book. Well, I really have to go now. I have to be home before dawn. Perhaps you would like to come with me. We could grab a quick bite. <laughs> Overall, I give Once Upon a Midnight Scary four death clocks out of ten. <laughs> Under Wraps, 1997. Have you ever wanted to see a live-action Patrick Starr dressed as a mummy shambling his way through helping some kids with questionable home lives? Well, Disney Channel's got you covered. Widely regarded as being the first Disney Channel original movie, it premiered on the Disney Channel in 1997. The film follows Marshall, the most disillusioned little boy on Earth, as he navigates his parents' divorce, his mom's new boyfriend, raising the dead, tax evasion... Oh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Marshall and his friend Gilbert go see a scary movie. <laughs> Wait, wait, it was just getting good! Anyway, Gilbert is uncomfortable with the idea of horror and putting himself into life-threatening situations. So of course he made it into this movie. Afterward, Marshall demands that he go collect his paperboy dues from Mr. Kubot, the creepiest, most homicidal man in town. It goes about as well as you might expect. A few days later, they learn that Mr. Kubot has died, and they do what any self-respecting small-town kids do when an elderly person of interest dies. Break into his house! Gilbert sees what he's pretty sure is a corpse and loses his glasses in his rush to bail out. Turns out Amy's mom had the keys all along, and perilously lowering Gilbert through a tiny-ass window was just for the lulls. They go back to retrieve his glasses and are greeted with this... comedy gold. <laughs> Pee funny. Despite scaring the bejeebus out of them, the mummy's actually not a bad guy. He even gives Gilbert his glasses back. The three agree to look after him for... reasons? And seek out some answers on how to help him. They go see a guy Marshall knows. Seriously, there should be a name for this trope if there isn't one already. The older nerd helping the younger nerds find some info that they need. Classic. Anyway. Bruce shows them a book on ancient Egypt that's oddly specific about mummy encounters. They learn that they've got to get him back into his sarcophagus by midnight on Halloween, or else! Meanwhile, the mummy, whom they've named Harold, indulges in what I can only call 90s shenanigans. Needless to say, he draws a lot of attention to himself. Luckily, the kids are on hand to whisk him back to Marshall's bedroom and hide him in plain sight. Thankfully, Marshall has the coolest bedroom I've ever seen. But apparently not cool enough for Harold, who disappears in the night. The kids track him back to a museum where they learn that Harold used to be a high priest and devoted his life to simp, I mean, serving a generic Egyptian queen. But before Harold can rekindle anything, they're discovered and they have to bail out. At this point, they hit kind of a slump, until Deus Ex's little brother shows up to give them some vital information for their everyday life. They decide Harold needs a makeover to make him less conspicuous, and... well... Yeesh! That's a Saturday night fever dream if I've ever seen one. They follow the clues back to a warehouse where they discover... Surprise! Kubot's not dead. So they book it out of there and devise a plan to steal back Harold's sarcophagus. After some sexy Halloween hijinks and a discovery by the bad guys, Bruce is pretty much forced to get them the hell out of there. But Harold gets left behind. Marshall's not gonna take that lying down, so the gang devises a plan to rescue their decomposing friend. Despite being a total chicken, Gilbert breaks them out. Literally, he brings down the house. But Kubot's here to remind us of a better time, when you could whip out a gun in a children's movie. But Harold's with the MPAA and he is having none of it. They make it back to the museum where Harold wakes his girlfriend up for five whole seconds before they both return to their eternal slumber. 
but not before one of those tear-jerky, we'll never forget you goodbyes. Then they both die happily ever after. This movie has all the earmarks of that golden decade or so of children's entertainment. We have the classic group of three. Marshall, the brave leader archetype, with an interesting pessimistic twist. Gilbert, the cowardly voice of reason who comes through in the end. And Amy, an absolutely savage girl who contrasts what most people think a young lady should act like. Seriously, this girl is brutal. Don't make me hurt you, Todd. First oh, okay. strike. Sorry. He's got a big crush on me, but it's definitely not going to happen. Why not? He saw that Olsen Twins movie twice. I mean, how can you respect a guy like that? Double kill. I out of my way, Leonard. And take your blanket with you. This isn't a blanket, it's a rag. I carry it around in case I have to wipe up something. Oh, yeah, right. And I'm not wearing a bra, I'm wearing a bulletproof vest. Triple kill. I don't know, he looks like my old Harold. Jeez, your aunt must be ready to open a vein. Over a kill. So much trouble. If I were you, I'd just worry about someone seeing me in those pajamas. Did they come like that, or do you have to cut out the feet? And my grandmother gave me these. Don't tell me you don't have some embarrassing pajamas at home. I don't wear pajamas. I sleep in the nude. Killing spree. What celibacy? No chicks. Oh. I can never do that. You'll get used to it. Betrayal. Under Wraps is a memorable movie, even just for its goofy fun. I give it seven simps of Egypt out of ten. <laughs> the Midnight Hour, 1985. Have you ever watched a movie that seems to have misplaced its script? Well, that's The Midnight Hour. Really, the only thing that gets straight to the point about it is this oddly abrupt little title sequence. Look out, it's The Midnight Hour, baby! <laughs> I swear, that wasn't an edit. That's just how it looks. And you'd think that this kid would be important. But no. He's just here to demonstrate how nauseatingly Norman Rockwell this town is. But you know who is important? Officer Red Foreman, and he's coming to put a foot in Halloween's ass. After that scenic bike tour, we're introduced to the Grenville family, whose dad runs a dental clinic out of their house? Uh... No thanks. And you'd think that that would be important too, but sadly, it's really not. Things really don't start to pick up until 10 minutes into this stink burger when we go to school and learn that everybody is hot for teacher, including LeVar Burton. We get a helpful exposition dump in the form of a slideshow that lays out the town's history as it relates to witchcraft and slavery. Turns out that Phil Grenville's ancestor owned one of his classmate Melissa's ancestors as a slave. Awkward. And if that weren't bad enough, Melissa's ancestor, Lucinda, was a powerful witch who summoned demons to torment the town. They even have a handy little museum about it. Which gives Mitch, the town Chad, the idea to break into the museum after hours and steal the costumes to wear to their sad little Halloween party that night. Melissa dresses as Lucinda, and Mitch dresses as Phil's ancestor, Nathan. Is that enough names for you? Since stealing the costumes wasn't enough of a thrill, they break into the archives, break a bunch of priceless antiques, and pack up what's left to take to the graveyard, where they discover a scroll written in blood, which they proceed to read aloud, like the classic horror movie morons that they are. LeVar Burton, you should know the power of reading by now! Melissa tries her hand at casting her ancestor's spell, but since nothing happens for the ten whole seconds that they wait, they pack up and leave the graveyard. As soon as they do, shit gets weird. I'm talking zombies exploding out of their graves as though they were filled with TNT. A cheerleader whom, despite being dead for 30 years, doesn't have a scratch on her, and Lucinda, rising from the grave and looking better than ever. While Lucinda is leading her zombie army into town, Phil's getting ready to go to their Halloween party as a... Kiss... Dracula? On the way over, he spots the newly risen cheerleader and falls instantly in love with her. But she's a little preoccupied. It turns out, a lot of things have changed in 30 years, and she can't find anything. But that's fair. She's a little, uh, preoccupied too. Is this Maple Avenue? What the hell 
was that? The gang reunites at the party where Vinny's costume is somehow worse than Phil's. Everyone shows up, including their teacher, which isn't weird at all. And since it's Halloween, no one can recognize people who've clearly been dead for decades. Something interesting finally happens when Mitch's dad is straight up murdered by a serial killer that he's sentenced to death. Man, why aren't we focused on that story? Instead, we have to watch the worst security guard ever get turned into a werewolf for reasons. Wasn't this movie supposed to be about witches? Even Lucinda forgot that she's a witch when she chows down on Melissa like a vampire. Lucinda turns Melissa, Melissa turns Vinny, and so on and so forth, and they all live in the house that Jack built. Phil eventually bails on the party after he realizes that literally everyone is gonna make it tonight but him. As he's going home, he spots the cheerleader, who turns out is kind of a freak for drag. Racing, that is. But their post-race makeout session is interrupted by... I can't even call him Wolfman Jack because Wolfman Jack is in this movie! They tell Officer Red Foreman that they were attacked by a werewolf, but that goes about as well as you'd expect. Get out of my office, dumbass! Sandy the cheerleader puts two and two together and realizes that the ritual they did in the graveyard is what unleashed all the monsters and whatever she is on the town. She just didn't get the memo they were all supposed to be evil. Seriously, it says so in the ritual. So what did she do to get sent to hell? Tell another girl she could stand to lay off the chocolate malteds? Apparently she knows a thing or two about dark magic, since she tells Phil that they need to make a seal out of his ancestors' bones and reseal the scroll before midnight. Or else. She must have learned that in her dark arts and home ec class. This all seems pretty time sensitive, right? I mean, places to go, people to see, bones to collect. Nah, we got time to interrupt the plot for a full on dance number. You guys couldn't afford more than the first 10 seconds of Morrissey's How Soon Is Now. How did you afford five whole minutes of choreographed music video? I guess we know where the music budget to this went. Hell, this movie is so broke after this that they can't even afford public domain music. They recycle the chorus of Pagliacci's Vesti la Guiaba seven times. Just sing the damn aria! Why? Like, the rest of the movie music is from the 60s and 70s! Why Pagliacci? Why? I have already given this film much more time than it deserves, but it's just so weird. It's like a stream of consciousness caught on film. Mitch's zombie dad starts chasing Sandy and Phil, but takes a detour to the party to kill Mitch, I guess? Meanwhile, back at his house, Phil starts making the seal and is confronted by his zombie dad, which will never be explained or resolved. They go back to the house to get the ring, but surprise! Everyone's a zompire or a vambi. What the f ever? I don't even know anymore. There's five minutes of this shit left. They chase Phil and Sandy into a room, kind of Night of the Living Dead style, and Phil tears the ring off Mitch's finger. They still need Nathan Grenville's bones, which are, of course, in the cemetery. Which is, of course, crawling with zombies. Somehow they bumble and fumble their way into resealing the scroll, and a cheesy effect beams everyone up, including Sandy. All of Phil's friends and family are dead, but hey, at least Wolfman Jack remembered to play Sandy's dedication to him. So call that a W, I guess? Gods, this was so much energy for so little reward. I feel exhausted just talking about it. I give the Midnight Hour three zompires out of ten vambies. It makes as much sense as anything else in this movie. <laughs> Crybaby Lane, 2000. This one is perhaps a little less obscure now that the Splat and Teen Nick reintroduced it to the general public. But still, it's not one that many people talk about. When it initially premiered in 2000, it took 11 years for it to get a second airing. Perhaps it was too spoopy for Snick, or perhaps the PG-13 action was a little too spicy for parents. But the widely accepted truth is that they just forgot about it. So that's a little anticlimactic. But hey, Sabrina the Teenage Witch endorsed it, so it must be good, right? Carl and Andrew are brothers who are really into girls and ghost stories, but mostly girls. 
They hang out at the local funeral home where Mr. Bennett tells them cool, creepy stories that he may or may not have something to do with. It's there that we learn about a farmer in the 60s who had conjoined twins and, you know, I'll just let him tell you about it. The farmer hid them away. As they grew, it became clear that one was good and the other was evil. Now it happened that one of the twins fell ill. And because they shared the same liver, the illness quickly spread and they both perished. Not wanting to expose his shame, the farmer decided to unjoin the bodies and bury only the good son in the town cemetery. He buried the evil son in a fallow field at the end of an old dirt road called Cry Baby Lane. Carl is kind of an asshole. Okay, Carl is really an asshole, but in his own anachronistic way, he's trying to look out for his brother. Which is why he gets him in on the plan to scare some girls, which might land them some dates, somehow? He retells the story that they heard earlier, but embellishes it a lot. Through sheer dumb luck, Carl pulls a weed and accidentally awakens the spirit of the bad twin while setting up his brilliant plan. Turns out that Bennett put the twins in the wrong holes because... Uh, I'm a bad undertaker. <laughs> I'm much better with animals. But now, everyone in town is turning evil. Dogs, cows, teen girls, the police. Wait, that's normal. Even this little guy is getting in on it. A ring of gold to rule them all, to seek them and to find them. A ring of gold to be their king, and in my power bind them. Oh, he's weaponizing Tolkien. They're so cute at that age. Carl is also evil now, or maybe that's just Carl. In either case, the entire movie culminates in a car chase and a mad dash to the grave at the end of Crybaby Lane. But just as Andrew's about to wrap up the plot, the evil twin hits the reset button and sends him back to start. He does not pass go, and he certainly does not collect $200. Man, that is a final boss move. To make things even more difficult, he sort of sucks Andrew underground? But Andrew manages to grab hold of that dank weed before he's buried alive. But since this is a kid's movie, he manages to dust himself off and everything's fine. This movie gives me mad, extended, are you afraid of the dark episode vibes, especially with the awesome score. The imagery still manages to be creepy, especially the black and white flashbacks. But since it's a kid's movie, they never go too far with it. Though I am left with some questions, not the least of which is, if they're twins, why does the good twin cry like an infant while the bad twin sounds like the guy in the back of your subway car who's definitely on drugs and wants everyone to know? Mine, Andrew. I'm your brother now. Brave boy. I give Crybaby Lane eight conjoined twins out of ten. Or should that be four sets of conjoined twins? Hmm. Crown of Bog, 1981. It's ALF. It's fucking ALF! With a discount Fraggle Rock plot and cheap-ass puppets. Paul Fusco made some Halloween specials for Showtime where he recycled premises and puppets. And this was the worst of them. All the acting and reads are stiff as death, and the jokes drag on FOREVER. King ALF, I mean... Mildew is retiring and he's leaving his throne to his son Milo, who doesn't want it. So King Mildew Nothing sings him a song about how it's better to be king than a scrubby peasant. Top is bad. <laughs> These people need you now. That's right, we're really in a mess. Hey, tops, bottoms, it doesn't matter as long as everyone's having fun, which I'm not. Then King Mildew's brother shows up and says his son should be king. 
But don't worry, guys, they're definitely not evil. So they go to these three morons for a quest. They task them with bringing back the crown of Bog before midnight, but conveniently leave out the part where the one clutching it after midnight will turn to stone. So, Mildew and his son go on their quest, and Vandred and his son pull some wily coyote bullshit that yields no results. It doesn't even slow them down. After talking to some weird-looking kids, Milo and Mildew find the crowd at a museum curated by bad actors. The head of the museum eventually figures out who they are and why they want the crown, only for Muppet, Snidely, Whiplash, and Muttley to show up. Then they have the dumbest fight scene I have ever seen. Ah, drapes, my one weakness. After four whole minutes of translating, the head of the museum can read their ancient language and tells them that the crown will turn them to stone if they're touching it even a minute after midnight. So Mildew launches it at Vandred and turns him to stone. The end. Thanks for nothing. This plot doesn't even tie up its loose ends. Does Milo become king? Is anyone suspicious of Vandred and his son disappearing? Does anyone care? The answer to all three of these questions is a resounding, probably not. Let's move on. The Crown of Bog gets a poultry two sad hand puppets out of ten. When Good Ghouls Go Bad, 2001. Our second best movie on this list is a made-for-TV masterpiece based on a story by the king of children's horror himself, Mr. R.L. Stein. It stars Christopher Lee, who plays Uncle Fred, a delightfully eccentric yet deeply troubled old man who loves dropping super brutal truth bombs on you out of nowhere. One of the first things you learn in life is that things aren't always the way they appear to be. His grandson Danny moves back to Walker Falls, Minnesota with his father to reopen their chocolate factory. The same chocolate factory that his granddad practically built this town around. But Danny starts to realize that people don't seem to appreciate him being here. In fact, he becomes the target of some hardcore bullying by these two. Football boy and his sidekick, Major Dumbass, waste no opportunity to beat the crap out of him. But luckily, Uncle Fred's got his back and doesn't take any shit from anyone, not even his own son. There's more than one way to make a mark, Jamie. Being a big success is no guarantee of being a good father. At least we agree on that. But without Tweedledum and Tweedledumber, Danny wouldn't have heard about the curse of Curtis Danko and its impact on the town of Walker Falls. Apparently, Curtis Danko, brilliant art student and professional Edward Scissorhands cosplayer, died in a mysterious kiln accident on Halloween night, in a kiln that Uncle Fred provided to the school, working on a project for a contest Uncle Fred was sponsoring. And Football Boy's dad was the only one to see it happen. According to him, the sculpture that Danko was working on was so twisted, so evil, that only someone who had looked upon the devil himself could have made it. He also claims that Danko was metal enough to write a message in his own ashes, saying if they ever had another Halloween, he would come back and end them all. After seeing these two very important pieces of information, Football Boy's dad says he went blind for three days. If that seems a little too convenient to you, then give yourself a screenwriter's credit. But the town of Walker Falls takes it very seriously, and they don't have a Halloween or anything Halloween related for 20 years. Football Boy figures he can make some quick cash off the paranoia surrounding the statue and he and his goon recover it from the Danko Mausoleum. Meanwhile, Danny meets a girl who's converted the old Danko estate into a makeshift haunted house where she and the other kids of Walker Falls are going to make a sort of Halloween speakeasy this year. And Football Boy muscles in on the last room by reminding Dana that his mom is the cheerleading captain, and by reminding Danny that his dad is running for mayor and could make it very difficult for him to open a chocolate factory in town. Jeez, this kid's worked his way up from dumb bully to mid-level crime boss. He's gonna leave a chocolate Easter Bunny head in Danny's bed just to prove a point. But before Football Boy can kneecap anybody, Danny's dad calls a town meeting to bring them the good news that their financial worries are over, and all they have to do is celebrate Halloween in front of some Germans. 
People are not for the idea of valuing a curse-free town over steady employment. Even though 20 years without a Halloween sounds like the worst curse you could have to me. Despite having voted against it, the residents of Walker Falls wake up the next day to discover the entire town has been decked out in Halloween decor. The tackiest money can buy. And in the center of town is an impossibly precarious pyramid of pumpkins. Let's just take a moment to marvel at the beauty and majesty of it. Ah. Okay, moving on. Uncle Fred starts to convince the town that Halloween and pumpkin-related fun might not be such bad things. But then the pyramid collapses and he's killed by a pumpkin. You heard me correctly. Christopher Lloyd was killed by a falling pumpkin, but he's not out of the movie yet. In fact, he comes back as the living dead, and we learn that all this narration has been coming from beyond the grave. So zombie shenanigans ensue, and it turns out that Uncle Fred wasn't the only one who woke from their long dirt nap unexpectedly. Oddly friendly and festive corpses pop up all over town to try and get people into the spirit of the season. Eventually, they get organized and go out looking for Curtis Danko's statue, scaring the bejeebus out of everyone, including Miss Vanderspool, the most American American of all time, who has gone to pick up the German investors. I know how you fellas drive like the dickens on that auto van! <laughs> Eventually, the Walking Dead do find the statue in the makeshift haunted house set up in the old Danko estate, where everyone has gathered out of panic. Curtis Danko, who has evolved from Edward Scissorhands to Michael Jackson if he were in Kiss, arrives to present his statue. Everyone begs and pleads for him not to, but he just looks really confused. Yeah, you coward! Who are you people?! Then suddenly... Dragons! Oh my god, he just ran in. And the day is saved, thanks to... Ah! Thanks to... Ah! You done? Curtis has had enough of his shit, though, and pulls himself back together, determined that his work will be seen. Football Dad scurries away, and the statue is revealed to be... Uncle Fred. Everyone in town is understandably confused. What we learn is Curtis Danko admired Uncle Fred and wanted to honor him, but Football Dad wasn't having it. I could play you the clip, but let me just summarize for you. <clears throat> Wah! Wah! I live in the only town in America that values the arts over sports, and I don't know how to deal with that. My daddy was better than your daddy because my daddy liked cheese fries and arm punchies, or something like that. After that macho display of crying and babbling is over, Grandpa Football shows up and threatens Football Dad with, quote, a whooping he won't forget for the rest of his years. And everybody clapped. No, seriously, everyone applauds. I think it's to honor Uncle Fred, but my headcanon says it's for the zombie ass whooping that's going down outside. So Halloween is restored to Walker Falls, and everyone who's dead has a little monster mash before turning to dust. But according to Uncle Fred, who's still somehow narrating, it's comforting, so it's okay. The end. God, I love this movie. I give When Good Ghouls Go Bad 9 Killer Pumpkins out of 10. Mr. Boogity, 1986, and Bride of Boogity, 1987. Now, Katie, you ask me, what could be worse than Adventure Quest Elf? Well, you've stuck with me this long, so you must really want to know. Or you're just a glutton for punishment. Either way, how about a TV movie with the budget and acting talent of an elementary school play? I mean, seriously, look at this thing! Wow, the story of the first Thanksgiving is really different than I remember. I want to lie to myself and tell myself that there was an attempt to be spooky here. But when you peel back the layers of bad, there's just more bad! The most annoying family in the world moves into a giant house that they get on the cheap because it's haunted. Ooh, spooky! The daughter starts seeing things, mostly in the form of walking down hallways, very slowly. She tells her family, but they don't believe her. And why should they? They've all been pranking each other this entire time. 
But eventually the two little brothers start seeing things too. And that's when the three of them decide to go ask the man who sold them the house. Gomez Adams? Witherspoon's my name. Neil Witherspoon. <laughs> Joy buzzers. Well, this explains a lot. He tells them that their house used to belong to a pilgrim witch man who stole a woman's little boy to try to force her to marry him. Great plan. But the little boy dies of a cold before she can agree. Wow, that might actually be the most realistic thing about this movie. And now the widow's soul is trapped outside while the little boy, who is arguably the best actor in this trash heap. It's one, it's him. Who? Mr. Boogity. Be careful, Ollie. If he gets you, he could keep you here forever. Is trapped inside with Mr. Boogity. Oh, I forgot. Why is this called Mr. Boogity? Surely there's a good reason. Boogity! Boogity! Never mind. After the family decides that they ain't afraid of no ghost, they have possibly the most stupid supernatural encounter I have ever seen. Hey, Mr. Boogity! <laughs> Did that ghost just sneeze? I am so done with this movie. Thankfully, it's almost over. Just bear with me. Finally, the Frankenstein family defeat Mr. Boogity, and the widow and son are reunited, and everybody dies happily ever after, except... <laughs> but, but that's not fair. They cheated us! She can't come in! He's still in the house! That's against the rules! She can't come in because he's still in the cock a duty house! That's not fair! <laughs> I'm sorry about that. I uh, lost the happy for a minute, but the happy's back! <laughs> I wasn't expecting this to be scary going in, but I wasn't expecting the scariest thing about it to be the parenting, either! Okay, we went to the historical society- Oh no, wait, 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 wait. You gotta look at this guy. Huh? Isn't he uh, great? Daddy, I'm pregnant! Not now, honey. I want to show you this gag pregnancy test I came up with. There's no way this should have gotten a sequel. Now, let's talk about the sequel. It's really hard to find without someone's commentary attached to it or in just bits and pieces. But we here at RB Comics work hard to- health, I shouldn't review this entire movie in full, but if you have a stronger constitution than I, it's entitled The Bride of Boogity, and premiered in 1987. This wet, hot sack of garbage gets a fake vomit out of Sneezing Ghost. That's right, we're not even using numbers on this one. It doesn't deserve them. The Halloween Tree, 1993. The Halloween Tree is an animated feature-length film based on a novella by Ray Bradbury. A funny story, actually. The novella was originally a screenplay that he'd written for Chuck Jones in 1967, and unfortunately that fell through. But he was able to adapt it and lengthen it into a novel, and then back into a screenplay. 
Phew, that's a lot of editing. Despite all the back and forth, the Halloween tree has become one of the greatest, most underappreciated Halloween movies of all time. The color palette is a beautiful contrast between somber, cool colors and warm, autumnal magic. And Leonard Nimoy really sounds like he's having fun, is... Mound Shroud is the name. Carapus Clavicle Mound Shroud. And hearing Ray Bradbury's voice punctuate parts of the story with his own words is somehow whimsical. It's like... Everything is just like you remembered it as a child. The ravine. The ravine was filled with varieties of darkness, night, shadows, toad eyes, and raven beaks. The ravine, birthplace of wild mushroom, pale toadstool, whispers and drippings which call, come, stay, linger and hide, hide here forever, never go, stay, stay. The story sees a group of friends getting ready to go trick-or-treating, but they can't go without their friend Pip, who is just, apparently, the coolest kid you've ever known. They get to his house and he's not looking so hot, and even less so when they see his ghost running through the spooky ravine. They chase him down to Old Mound Shroud Manor, where they get a special Halloween edition of the Why You Suck speech for not knowing anything about their costumes. Wow, you know, I think I relate to this guy more and more as I get older. Anyway, Pipkin steals his pumpkin soul back from Mound Shroud and runs off with it, forcing him and the other children to chase him through time and space. Just look at all these unique ways they find to travel. Each time jump takes them to a point in history where a Halloween tradition is in full swing. The Feast of the Dead in Egypt, Samhain in Europe, and the Day of the Dead in Mexico. The only one that doesn't quite happen during a celebration is the Where Do Gargoyles Come From segment. But each segment is meant to teach a kid a facet of why Halloween is the way we know it today, so it makes sense that the monster kid would learn with the rest of them. Finally, they catch up with Pip in the Mexican catacombs, but just when they're about to help him, he crumbles to dust. Talk about childhood trauma. Mound Shroud reclaims his pumpkin soul, and the children barter for it, with a year of their lives, each. Faustian deals with death, you know, for kids. So they all go home, they find that Pipkin is just fine, and they all have a dark secret that they carry with them until Mound Shroud comes to collect. The Halloween tree takes our top spot with 10 pumpkin fire souls out of 10. It's so good, even the characters are impressed. Oh my gosh, it's- Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! If it seems like I said less about our top spot than any of the others, it's only because this is the sort of poetry that you have to experience for yourself. And on that note, that's it for me too. From everyone here at RB Comics, Happy New Year, Loving Feast of the Dead, and of course, Happy Halloween. Stay spooky, darlings. Ha 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 